uh, here in the Skowhegan area and all over the world online and, and those watching on channel uh, 11 in the Skowhegan Madison area, I want to welcome you. Things are a little different today as this is our first Sunday with a mask only mandate. However, up here we have uh, moved me further back. In fact, we've taken the front row out of the, uh, uh, the church and we moved it backwards um, just to cause a little bit more distance. And uh, I'm grateful that for those that are sitting out here and they're, uh, they're, they're listening to the mandate. Well, we're going to talk about something for a couple of weeks that is always important, I think. But it seems especially significant during this unique season of shelter-in-place orders and the economic uncertainty. If you would, I'd like you to take your Bibles out and turn to Matthew chapter, 30, uh, chapter 22, verses 34 through 30. I, as you're doing that, I did want to share that our general superintendent, Dr. Carla Sundberg, she was amazing at the retreat. Um, I have known general superintendents now for many, many years, and uh, uh, I've never met one that I didn't like immediately. And uh, she says, I'm just Carla. I'm just Carla. And the messages she gave were spot on. They were easily understood, and you could apply them to your lives. And she was real. So I really, I just wanted to say again, thank you for uh, allowing us to go to the retreat. Uh, Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. And uh, we've named this next two weeks uh, Love Where You Live because it, um, it, it really is the most basic and perhaps the most impactful way to demonstrate the love of Jesus to others. The events and restrictions of the past several months, what they've done is they've limited the travel to almost every mission field on earth, except the one, folks, maybe that we overlook the most. And that is to the ones right next door to where we live. There are probably some people listening today who are already thinking, man, with everything that's going on right now, I was hoping, I was hoping to go deeper. I want some profound theological truth that will blow my mind. Well, how about we focus on something that was such a profound theological thought that Jesus identified it as the second greatest commandment. As the, and I also want to be clear, as I'm guessing some of our neighbors watching online, uh, watching with us today, I'm not proposing that we have some sneaky backdoor presentation uh, you know, to, to how we do things, but really genuinely discover what it means to be a good neighbor more than State Farm. And it really doesn't matter what your background is because you can benefit from this concept. Let's go to the word, starting with verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard they had, that he had silenced the Sadducees, they came together. And one of them, an expert in the law, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. The second is, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets, all the law and the prophets depend upon these two commandments. So if I could, I want to give you a little review for some here. Important one. See, we've been given two powerful commands, haven't we? Um, the first is the Great Commission, which is go and make disciples. The second, the Great Commandment. Love God and love people. Everyone say that through your mask. Love God and love people. See, if you say it, then you own it. Every person can help bring a neighbor closer by understanding the biblical principles of loving your neighbor. Love your neighbor. In your notes, the proximity principle, if I could put it that way. And this is really important because if, if we're having a conversation right now, 
Some of you would tell me something like, Pastor, I know God called me to love my neighbor, but I think of my neighbors as my co-workers or my kids' three classmates at school, our church family. Not necessarily, not necessarily the people who happen to live next door. But the word here used in Matthew 22 and Luke chapter 10 for neighbor, it's telling. In the original text, the word for neighbor from the root literally means near or near to. In other words, a neighbor is something or someone that is close by. In other words, neighbor, the actual mean, it means actually neighbor, someone close by you. But here's the big idea. God has sovereignly placed you among your neighbors. You may not believe it by the way you treat one another, but it is the truth. God has put you among your neighbors. Remember in Luke's account, that same conversation? One of those listening asked Jesus to specify who qualified as a neighbor. Who is a neighbor? Well, Jesus' response was where we get one of the most famous parables, and that's called the Good Samaritan. And it's central to the idea of the Good Samaritan where people were trying to get around caring for their neighbors by redefining who their neighbors were, by focusing on current agendas and networks rather than dealing with the needs right there in front of them. Even if there was no previous relationship, the heart of the answer is that there is no one, no matter how different from you, who exempts you from the call to love your neighbor. Obviously, Jesus had in mind for us to love more people than those that just live right next door to us. But wouldn't that at least include those who live next door? Wouldn't it? So here's what you need to understand, and I'm trying to get, is the people around you were placed near you for a reason, my friends. We have made neighboring less than it really is. It means God has placed you next to the people to love them. Well, I don't like my neighbors. Maybe it's time we start obeying the Lord and love them. See, I fear that out of a desire to make everyone our neighbors, we've made no one our neighbors. The truth is you can see everyone as your neighbor and love them and honor God through it. But doesn't it seem especially awkward given that what the Scripture says about the importance of our placement, that we ignore our literal neighbor? So it turns out that the world is also discovering what Jesus said, and it's really a good idea. Malcolm Gladwell, in his book, The Outliers, told the story of a village in Rosetto, Pennsylvania. And it's a town made up entirely of citizens that came from a village of Rosetto uh, Valvatore in Italy. So intrigued by the extremely low incidence of disease in Rosetto, including no coronary artery disease in anyone younger than 55. What happened was is four medical researchers in the 1960s, they dedicated themselves to studying this phenomenon. Why this small little area in Pennsylvania were doing so well with their health? Well, they found that their diets were not any better, but their connections to their neighbors were profound. So much so that they actually lived longer. But this isn't some new discovery. It's God's idea. In fact, in the book of Acts, which I was just going through last night, chapter 17, verses 24 and 27, Paul is speaking to philosophers in Athens. Verse 24 on the screen, it will say to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in shrines made by hands, neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives everyone life 
and breath and all things, ready? From one man he has made every nation to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and their boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Did you catch that? You were placed in your neighborhood for a reason. And so were your neighbors. They may not understand it, but you do now, don't you? Amen? The church today has more literature or media or programs and training for reaching others than at any other time in history. But the church in America, in most areas, is declining. So could it be as simple as we've forgotten the foundational part of the process? That Jesus said, we start with our neighbors. So just imagine, if you will, would you just imagine if God's people caught a vision for the most basic command that Jesus gave us? So look at the verb. God calls you to love your neighbor. Next is the kindness principle. So what does it mean to love your neighbors? Well, sometimes we overlook the practical idea of loving. What if the command said, like your neighbor? Well, hey, God wants us to like. Well, what would you do to express that you like your neighbor? Well, that might be easier than to think about it like this. That may just be kindness and be a ramp up to loving them. So here's the bottom line. God is calling us, he is calling us to invest in our neighbors, sacrifice for our neighbors when necessary, and ultimately show the kindness of God to our neighbors. With this in mind, I've observed a great irony in the church. See, many, many Christians, we tend to jump to the great commandment, you know, to love God and love people, in order to get to the great commission to make disciples. But they don't want to invest the energy to share the kindness. But sometimes are surprised when people who are still strangers aren't interested in our, our message of hope. Understand, folks, we have to do both. We have to do both to be effective. How does it work? Well, last spring, some men of the church came over to my house and we built a raised vegetable garden bed. And it's a monster. It's huge. And it's this wonderful raised bed. And Karen and I were thrilled to get started on our garden. Now, there's a few ways. There's a couple of ways to, to get started in your garden. You can plant seeds, right? Or you can go down to the store and you can buy some plants, you know, the, the ready-to-go uh, seedlings, right? The little guys, right? So what do they do differently? Nothing. But for the seeds, you have to wait, don't you? You have to wait a little longer. And here's the point. There are no seedlings in the kingdom. There's nothing already sprouted. You have to start with the seed and you trust when you can't see the progress. Or as Jesus puts it, you have to love your neighbor. And I don't mean meeting your neighbor just so you can make a presentation of the Roman road and invite them to church. It's not what I'm talking about. It means getting to know the people around us because they're worth getting to know. It means, it means listening as much as talking. It meant letting the Holy Spirit do the work in you in the midst of your relationships. I think the worst thing I've ever heard sometimes is, well, I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried. What does that tell you? Quit trying. you got to quit trying. you got to let God work through you. And that takes God's timing. And we must be willing to wait. How then 
Are we to love these neighbors? Well, Jesus tells us to love your neighbor as yourself. So I want you to do something for me. I want you to just hone in on that word, yourself. Yourself. I think of how very much we do love ourselves. How much of our activity centers around our comfort and care. I mean, isn't that primary in our lives? We want to be fed. We want to be warm. We want to be dry. We want someone else to shovel the snow. Don't we? Then we should try to imagine what it would be like if we showered that love that we put on ourselves, what if we showered that love on our neighbors? Wow! I don't know if I've ever done that. Well, then we should do it. Amen? Folks, I love that New Horizons Community Church is so intentional about meeting the deepest needs of people all over the world through the work that we do on our mission fields, our special offerings and such. But we cannot call ourselves a missional people if we simultaneously ignore the needs or neglect to be kind to those nearest in everyday life. It's not one or the other. So often I've said when it comes to missions, it's so much easier just to put money in the offering plate than to actually, hi. Well, money in an offering plate, that's, we're, we're so blessed financially, that's not hard. It's anonymous. There's, there's no skin in the game. The people around you matter. And they matter immensely to God. Have you ever thought about how these two, these two commands are connected? Hmm? Love God and people. We love God with everything in us because God loved us first. So if you look closely at the story of that good Samaritan, you'll see that Jesus, Jesus is the role of the Samaritan. What are you talking about? A stranger who had no obligation whatsoever to help someone who could have been considered the enemy. I mean, isn't that what our sin does? Makes us enemies with God? Yet he stepped out of his own rights, he entered into our pain, and he gave his own life for us. That is the heart of the gospel. Some of you need to begin there. You see, when, when we say people matter immensely to God, we're saying you matter immensely to God. Do you understand that? Jesus gave his life for you. Listen, I wonder whether today someone is ready to place their trust in Christ. For all of us, I wonder whether we're ready to be intentional about this command, you know, to, to love our neighbors. So I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to join me these next few weeks in this opportunity to begin to show kindness to your neighbors. The Lord has been talking to me about one particular neighbor on my street for about three weeks now. And I'm just wrestling. You know what that means when we say we're wrestling with God? We're not letting him in our... We're not accepting his will. Now, I'm wrestling with God. What a foolish thing to do. Now, I don't know if the barriers have ever been lower. Think about it here. Here's what the challenge involves. It means you reach out to your neighbors and you get connected. Look for a friendly way to connect with them. All right? And understand there's COVID, so don't bring them a half-eaten cake or something like that. Here... But look for friendly, safe ways to connect with them in the coming days. You'll find you're going to love it. If we really want to love someone, it's really helpful to know their first name. Can I tell you, there's a difference between, hey bro, and hey Joe. Okay? It's immense. So I want you, and before you go out and you do that mission 
where you knock on that door, would you pray for your neighbors? Many of whom are facing some really unsettling days. Let's face it. How many of you right now, and I mean this, how many of you right now would say, with all that's gone on, I don't think I could make it without Christ? Well, neither can your neighbor. Neither can your neighbor. So let me show you how easy it is to love your neighbors. Let me show you. I want you to get started, and I want you to make one simple, symbolic step. I want you to take those chairs that are maybe sitting on your back porch and move them to your front porch. Now, I understand that some of you live in rural areas, and it doesn't matter where you put your chair. But maybe, maybe you can find a chair somewhere where there's other people. Hmm? Maybe as you sit there in the evening or wherever it is, just watch how God uses the time. Remember, you're going because it's not your time, it's God's time, and God can, can direct your paths. Isn't that what we pray? So will you take the challenge? And here's what gets real fun about all this. As you begin this journey, man, you are going to feel uncomfortable and you're going to press on. And you know why I'm glad and why I'm smiling about you feeling uncomfortable? When you start something that God asked you to do and you're uncomfortable about it, and then you get to that comfort level with it and you expand your loving your neighbor, that whole from uncomfortable to can't stand it to, to oh, I'm getting it to where I got it to where I live it, that is a huge testimony for the Lord. So loving your neighbor... That's a simple message, loving your neighbor. So simple, most of us don't do it. But can loving your neighbor become part of your DNA, of who you are? A little girl once stayed the night for dinner at a friend's house. The vegetable was buttered broccoli. And the mother asked her if she liked it, and the child replied very politely, oh, yes, I love it. But when the broccoli was passed, she declined to take any. The hostess said, I thought you loved broccoli. And she said, well, the girl replied sweetly, oh, yes, ma'am, I, I do, but not enough to eat it. <laughs> if you don't believe me, just switch the word broccoli with Brussels sprouts. Devil food, that's what that is. I'm telling you. Yeah, devil food. That got slipped in there somehow, I don't know. One cannot define one's neighbor. One can only be a neighbor. Haddon Robinson said, your neighbor is anyone whose need you see. Whose need you see you are able to meet. And immediately right now in your mind, the devil is telling you you cannot meet the needs of any of your neighbors, and that is a lie. You have tremendous ability to help a neighbor. Did you know that? Folks, if you can bake cookies, a dozen for yourself, bake two and give one away. It's that simple. You see a neighbor down the street, and they're, 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 stay right there. Your lawn is, their lawn is covered with leaves. Bring a rake. Go there with your tractor or your lawnmower and pick them up. It's not hard. What is mine is God's. And what is God's belongs to my neighbor because my neighbor belongs to him. Let's pray. And let's pray for our neighbors. Father, here in the church, we often think of mission fields as third world countries and traveling over oceans. But Lord, as we've seen from the text today and from the story of Christ himself, our neighbor is right next door. And somehow, Lord, maybe... Maybe this morning I feel more responsible for that, that commandment and commission than I ever have. Because you're talking to my heart about just simply walking down the street and starting to share life 
And then once I get to know them, I can share them the good life, the abundant life. So right now, Lord, I'd ask that you would help my friends listening and watching on television and those here in church. Right now as I pause, would you put the picture of a house or a neighbor on our street or in our life right now? Just go ahead and do that. Is that who you're telling me to call on, Lord? Or am I going to wrestle with you? Am I going to wrestle with you over that face? Regardless of past experience with them, am I going to wrestle with you? Or am I really going to believe thy will be done on earth? I'm looking forward, Lord, to hearing the testimonies of people beginning to love their neighbors as you love us. And we'll give you praise for those future testimonies and for those lives that can be touched. Because, Lord, everyone here that is a true believer is a believer because somebody sacrificed the time. And while we have so little of it here, help us to give it away like it's free. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Oh